In 1953, in Dehradun, a city in the north of India, a man known as Mehababa announced to the world that he was the Avatar, the Ancient One, who came before as Zoroaster, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus and Muhammad. It would be very easy to dismiss this man as completely mad, a guru whose ego had grown to enormous proportions. However, his lifestyle was so unique that he can't be easily ignored. During the last 44 years of his life, in a whirlwind of intense activity and world travel, he kept complete silence. He did not utter a word. His messages and discourses, as well as casual conversations, were conveyed through an alphabet board and later with his own language of hand gestures. He promised that he would one day break his silence, thereby generating a new humanity based on love and intuition. Although he died on January the 31st, 1969, without ever actually speaking, many of his followers believe that his silence will soon be broken and that this event will be signaled by a great physical and spiritual upheaval in the world. A story about Mayababa appeared in Time magazine after a visit to the United States in 1932. He was later featured on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine with an article written by his follower, Pete Townsend, of the rock band The Who. And Mayababa's death at the age of 74 was covered in the New Yorker magazine in June of 1969. Who was this man? A hypocrite and a fraud? A well-meaning but deluded spiritual guide? Or the living Christ come again in human form to rejuvenate man's love for God. You know, Baba has said so many times, you give a pinch of yourself to me, a pinch, and I give you that much. It is true. You just give a pinch of yourself and Baba gives you that much. It's no picnic. I mean, it really is no picnic. He really can dish it out to you. I mean, if you're, uh, you have to be brave. First of all, you have to be brave if you want to journey towards God because it means an a certain amount of abnegation. It means a lot of giving up of your own ego and it, um, you will be put into difficult situations. You might have things that are, hey, what am I, do what am I doing all this for? You, you have all kinds of things to overcome. The mystery of his silence, you know, is, has been an, a factor in the appeal. That um, this person obviously is different. You know, most people talk all the time, maybe too much, particularly a lot of religious people. But here is one who said what he had to say, as it were, by, by silence. He was born Merwan Sharia Irani on the morning of February the 25th, 1894, in Pune, India. 100 miles from Bombay. He was the second of six children born to Sharia and Shireen Irani. Sharia, a native of Persia, was of Zoroastrian faith and deeply spiritual. When he was 39, he married Shireen, who was but 14 at the time. Together they owned a small home, which they referred to as the Pumpkin House. Moans was a happy yet uneventful childhood. Those who knew him said he was active and mischievous, yet gentle and unselfish. He was interested in music and poetry and excelled in sports. He attended the Catholic St. Vincent's High School and later Deccan College in Pune, where his main interests were literature and poetry. A fan of Shelley, Wordsworth and Shakespeare, Moan's own poems were published in the newspapers of Bombay. One day in 1913, while cycling home from college, he had a dramatic encounter with an old Muslim woman who would change his life. Known as Hazrat Babajan, she was said to be over 100 years old and accepted by many as a perfect spiritual master. Babajan called to him as he was cycling past her. She later kissed him on the forehead, which, as Mayababa claims, gave him immediate realization of God. 
For the next nine months, he had no consciousness of his body or his surroundings. Baba later described the state he was in at this time. I received no promptings from my mind as would an ordinary man. I had no knowledge of the things I did or did not do. I did not sleep and had no appetite. No one had any idea throughout this period that I did everything by instinct, more like an automaton than an ordinary human being. My mother thought I was mad and called for medical help. The doctors could do nothing. His condition had lasted for nine months when Mowan was suddenly drawn to seek out various spiritual masters in that region of India. Narayan Maharaj of Kedgaon, Tajuddin Baba of Nagpur, and Sai Baba of Shirdi. Sai Baba recognized Mowan and sent him to his chief disciple, a Hindu, Upasni Maharaj. When Mowan approached him, Maharaj greeted Mowan, so to speak, with a stone, which he threw at him with great force. It struck Mowan on the forehead, exactly where Babajan had kissed him. This bizarre event apparently signaled the return of Mowan's normal consciousness. He proceeded to spend the next six years with Yupasni and was gradually brought back down to a normal, functioning state. Mowan said that during that time he had complete awareness of the world of duality while retaining consciousness of his divinity. Possessing infinite knowledge and infinite ignorance, God realized, yet operating on the level of an ordinary human being. Many who encountered him during this period, including former schoolmates and friends, witnessed a profound transformation in Mowan that inspired them to leave everything and follow him. Others were attracted to him by hints from Babajan and Maharaj. It was during this period that one follower, Sayyid Sahib, first addressed Mowan as Mehababa, meaning literally, compassionate father. In 1922, he was 28 years old and living in a thatched hut near Pune. After four months passed, he and a group of followers set out for Bombay where Maya Baba established his first ashram and named it Manzili Meem, or House of the Master. Here, everyone was required to work in the ashram as well as a conventional job in the workplace. Living near Baba required strict obedience, including orders concerning diet, play, and exercise. The men and women drawn to him at this time were from a variety of social and religious backgrounds, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, and were given the name Mandali, a Sanskrit word meaning group or company. Times were designated for prayer and meditation, but generally there seemed to exist the spiritual practice of just plain day-to-day -day living, with the normal challenges of interacting with each other and society at large. The traditional fasts and feasts of various religions were kept, though Baba used to point out that they had nothing to do with spirituality, nor did he advocate them with that object. He said, however, that followers of a religion should continue to observe the rules and customs of their particular faith. Occasionally during this period, Baba and the Mandali provided services for the sick, poor, and others in need. After 10 months, the ashram was abruptly closed, and for the next year and a half, Maya Baba and his Mandali traveled continuously throughout India, once going as far as Iran. They finally settled in a deserted military camp near Ahmednagar in central India. This unlikely new home gradually became known as Mayarabad. Over the course of the next year, Mehrabad turned into a virtual small town with 500 inhabitants. It offered a free school, hospital and dispensary, as well as a hermitage for lepers and the destitute. Children of all castes and creeds, including untouchables, soon began to live, eat and intermingle freely. Mayor Baba took an active part in every phase, including cleaning the latrines and bathing the schoolchildren. Of the many new buildings at Mehrabad, the first to be constructed was known as the Jopti, a small square room where Baba would often sit in seclusion. 
on the night of July the 9th, 1925, before retiring into this hut, he announced that beginning the following morning he would no longer speak and that he would maintain this silence for the next one and a half years. Forty-four years went by, and despite occasional indications that the silence would be broken, Mayor Barber did not utter a single word. He communicated at first with chalk and slate, soon dropping this method in favor of an English alphabet board. Rapidly pointing to the letters, he would effectively carry on a conversation with his disciples. There has been much controversy regarding this silence. Baba indicated that it was undertaken as a means to conserve his spiritual energy and declared, you have asked for and been given enough words. It is now time to live them. In a statement which became one of his most famous, he added that all things that are real are given and received in silence. The silence, I think, was an important um, sign, you might say, a prophetic sign or symbol on his part. And this is, uh, uh, you know, always raises questions of what is he saying by not speaking. His silence, it was quite different. It was not just people observe silence. It was not so. Through silence, he was working. He made the silence as his medium for his universal work. On his 32nd birthday in February of 1926, more than 20,000 people came from all over India for his darshan, or blessing. Later that year, the school, hospital and dispensary, which were all thriving in Mayorabad, were suddenly closed. Throughout his life, Baba frequently opened and closed various ashrams and places of service, designing them only as outward aids to the actual inner work he meant to accomplish. After terminating the community functions at Mayorabad, Baba set up a unique boys' school he named Maya Ashram which was open to all castes, races, and nationalities. Here, Baba concentrated on the general welfare and spiritual upliftment of the boys. In January of 1929, this too was closed down, as Mayor Baba began a phase of extensive travel, which would last for the next 20 years. After moving throughout India, he visited Africa, China, North America, Europe, and the Middle East. He sailed to England via the SS Rajpatana, on which Mahatma Gandhi was also a passenger. Gandhi was impressed by Maya Baba, and despite the fact that the London newspapers described Baba as Gandhi's spiritual advisor, Baba had told the Mahatma that he would not be able to offer any real spiritual help unless Gandhi resolved to give up politics. Evidently, Gandhi felt his work of liberating India more pressing than a life devoted to Meher Baba. Baba indicated that he traveled in order to carry out his inner work of awakening, and his help to humanity was on both individual and collective levels. He mostly traveled incognito, at times walking silently through crowded city streets other times meeting with various seekers who expressed an interest in him. He gave no importance to founding any organization in his name, advocating no particular method of meditation or other practices associated with the popular image of Eastern masters. He stressed only love for God. Of the many stories about Maya Baba which appeared in local newspapers, most were favorable, but when unfavorable or sensational reports appeared, he was not disturbed. On April 8, 1932, Maya Baba was interviewed by the British historian Charles Purdom for a newsreel produced by the Paramount Film Company. Train Maya Baba has come from India with a message to the West. He does not convey this message by speaking, but by his mere presence. 
when he wishes to communicate with people, he uses this board and points to the uh, letters on it. My object in coming to the West is not with the intention of establishing new creeds or spiritual societies and organizations. I see the structure of all the great religions of the world tottering. The West is more inclined towards the material side of things. I intend to bring together all religions and cults like beads on one stream and revitalize them for individual and collective needs. This is my mission to the West. That's what he came for. He did not come to teach, teach a new religion. He came to awaken us. And that's why he's been called the Awakener. It's to wake us up. You know, you could argue that we don't really need another religion. We've got plenty of religions. We need people to exemplify the values of the religions we have. But, uh, you know, you can also argue, and I think that um, followers of Mayor Baba and many others would say this, that conditions in the 20th century world and now the 21st century world practically are so different from conditions in the past eras when the great religions we now have developed that maybe we do need somebody or some uh, movement that will radically reinterpret what religion is all about. Of course, we go to temple, we go to church, we go to mosque, we pray only for the sake of prayer, mechanically. Whether we follow Prophet Muhammad, whether we follow Ram, Buddha, mechanically we perform prayers, meditate, just like for the sake of uh, interest, and it has no, no meaning, unless heart is open towards God and love is there. In May of 1932, after visiting Italy, France and Switzerland, as well as New York and Chicago in the United States, Mayor Baba arrived in Los Angeles, California. He stayed for one week, meeting with the press, local ministers and religious heads, and members of the Hollywood film community. He visited MGM and Paramount Studios and met a number of actors, including Gary Cooper and Tallulah Bankhead. Mary Pickford held a reception in his honor at her Beverly Hills home, Pickfair. He indicated that the film industry has tremendous power to stimulate and direct the public's imagination and hinted at the higher responsibility of the film community to portray stories of love and selfless service. Mayor Baba asserted that the purpose of all life is for each of us to realize our oneness with God. He likened the original state of God to a tranquil, infinite ocean of power, knowledge and bliss. However, this ocean was unconscious of itself as God. Latent within this original ocean was what Mayor Baba called the initial urge or whim to know itself as God. What resulted was the merging of infinite space and infinite energy, the beginning of creation. To use the example of God as an infinite ocean, we can see the individual drops which make up that ocean as the individual drop souls that inhabit the earth. Each individual drop experiences itself to be separate from the ocean and asserts its separative existence as a drop. Rather than identifying itself as the ocean or God, the drop soul begins its journey in consciousness by identifying with and taking various forms. We begin at the most rudimentary form of consciousness, the stone form, and then evolve through increasingly complex physical forms, metal, vegetable, worm, fish, bird, animal, and finally attaining full consciousness in the human form after eons and eons of time. This process parallels, in some respects, the theories of Charles Darwin, though it is a fundamentally different explanation of evolution. Evolution, in Mayer Baba's view, is necessitated by the development of consciousness. Thus, form follows consciousness, 
and not, as in Darwin's theory, the other way around. According to Mehababa, after the human form is attained, the soul then reincarnates systematically to gain necessary experience. Concerning the theory of reincarnation, it may be said that there is only one life in the journey of the soul, though there are innumerable births and deaths in gross physical forms. While identification with these life forms allows for an ever-increasing development of consciousness, it also creates a false notion of separateness, the ego. Mayababa has explained that karma is the spiritual law of cause and effect, in which the experience of every impression creates the demand for the experience of its opposite. The heavy load of impressions, or imprints of experience, acquired in evolution, becomes a considerable karmic burden in the human form. Eventually, the individual begins to tire of the endless rounds of births and deaths, and is overcome by a profound dissatisfaction with illusory existence. At this point, the individual is ready for the spiritual path, or as Mayababa called it, involution. Involution may be seen as the ascent back to God and is marked by seven levels or planes of consciousness. The first three planes, Mayababa said, are of the subtle world, the world of energy. The fifth and sixth are of the mental world, the world of intellect, intuition, emotion and desire. The fourth plane links the subtle and mental worlds. The experience of the seventh plane is God-realization, the goal, and is beyond the illusory gross, subtle, and mental worlds. With God-realization, the journey of consciousness is complete. The dropped soul falls back into the ocean to experience with full consciousness the I am God state. Each individual is nothing but a drop but that drop contains the ocean. So long that drop has no consciousness of the reality, it is a drop. When there is the experience of reality, then it becomes the ocean. In 1936, Mayababa began a unique phase of his work. He began contacting those who have become partially or completely unconscious of their physical bodies, as well as their actions and surroundings. Having slowed down the working of the mind through their intense loving and longing for God, these individuals, whom Baba referred to as musts, have begun involution and are said to be closer to the God state. The work of contacting these musts usually meant long journeys with the Mandali often through jungles and across mountains, most of the time regardless of food or sleep. Several of the Mandali were expert must-finders who would scour remote areas of India for these unique individuals. Baba would either visit these places or the must would be brought to a special must community or ashram. Baba spent a great deal of time in seclusion with them and saw personally to their needs washing, feeding, and shaving them. Mayababa indicated that it is extremely difficult to distinguish between a madman and a must. The mad have distorted ideas about their bodies and surroundings, while the musts have an utter disregard for theirs, because their hearts are imbued with love for God. Despite their eccentricities, the musts are greatly revered by spiritually alert Indians. And though the must has attained a certain spiritual advancement, he or she has done so without proper guidance and are stuck on the spiritual path. Baba did not, therefore, endorse the path taken by musts for those who seek a spiritual life. On other occasions, Maya Baba took extraordinary steps to contact the poor, the blind and the infirm, especially lepers, whom he called beautiful souls in ugly cages. He would often bathe them, bow down to their feet, and present them with small gifts. In 
It should be noted that Mayor Barber never kept money, and he touched currency only when passing it on to the poor or the musts. In October of 1949, Mayor Barber sold and dispersed almost all of the property and possessions that were being used by he and the Mundali, and began yet another distinctive phase in his ministry. Along with a small band of 22 disciples, Barber entered what he called the new life, a life of renunciation, a life of hopelessness and helplessness, yet of cheerfulness, relying only on God. The new life fascinated me during Baba's lifetime. I asked him a number of things about it, and he all sort of put me off and said that uh, I would learn about that and he would uh, help me to understand it later on. Certainly, it was the project that, to my knowledge, involved the greatest amount of planning and the most rigorous uh, conditions and, let us say, agreements between Mayor Baba himself and the people who followed him into the new life. The group wandered across India, begging for their needs, while continuing to render service to humanity. Although this phase ended in February of 1952, sooner than expected, Mayor Barber said that the spirit of the new life is endless and will live by itself eternally, even if there is no one to live it. Mayor Barber then initiated a decade of communication with the public in both the East and the West. At Barber's request, two American disciples, Elizabeth Patterson and Narina Machabelli, established a retreat for him in the United States. And in April of 1952, Barber, with five men and six women Mundali members, visited Mayher Spiritual Center on 500 acres of land in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. He called this center his home in the West and said that one day it would become a place of pilgrimage. Most people that have been drawn to him have, uh, in my experience, also been people that have been very much drawn to the path of devotion and love, what Hindus would call bhakti, as their spiritual way because he seems to embody it so fully. He's just overflowing with, with love for God and humankind. I've had many different people tell me over the years how they felt when Baba embraced them. Um, and when he embraced me, I, 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 can't, I can't put it in words because uh, there were arms around me. But I didn't feel anything. Some people said they gave me a bear hug. When, I, when his arms went around me, I just felt like I felt nothing, nothing at all. I felt so wonderful. I was so happy to be free and to be in this state of happiness and feeling his compassion and his love enveloping me. I said, oh, I'm home, <laughs> and I wanted to stay there, you know. Uh, I had been, as it were, under Baba's spiritual thumb for seven years before I came into his personal presence for the first time. And I would say that immediately there were two things that were so deep and so true and so startling um, that frankly I was rather disoriented. First of all, to realize that one is with another human being who for the first time in one's life one realizes completely, totally accepts one as one is. And the other thing is to feel the absolute, total oneness with another human being, as if he were your own self, deeper than you can even be your own self yourself. And to realize this instinctively is, of course, quite a shock. Mayor Barber had foretold that he would shed his blood on American soil, and on May the 24th, 1952, en route to California with four women disciples on board, his car collided with another just outside of Prague, Oklahoma. Mayor Barber was thrown out of the vehicle, his head bleeding, his left arm, left leg, and nose fractured. The four women Mundali were hurt as well, but there were no fatalities. Four years later, while driving in India, near the city of Sitara, Baba was involved in another serious car accident. This time, he was accompanied by the men Mandali. Dr. Nilu, a companion of Baba's since 1927, was killed. The other men were all badly injured and immediately hospitalized. Mayor Baba's hip 
was all but destroyed in the crash. In the first car accident in 52, Mayor Barber sustained injuries to the left side of his body, head to toe. In this accident, Barber injured his right side, also from head to toe. These physical ailments proved to be a cause of great suffering for him in subsequent years. After recovering from the 1952 crash, Mayor Baba arrived back in India in September of that year and again plunged into his work with the musts. Numerous mass darshan programs were also held in many villages and cities throughout India, drawing as many as 50,000 people at a time. In 1953, Mayor Baba made a most extraordinary claim. He made it clear that he was the avatar, the living Christ. While traveling in Dehradun, he explained his role as the highest of the high, who has come only for the sake of love. According to Mayor Baba, the same avatar repeats his manifestation from time to time, adopting different human forms and different names to reveal truth in different garbs and different languages in order to raise humanity from the pit of ignorance and free it from the bondage of illusions. Mayor Baba asserted that there is only one avatar and that he has appeared previously as Zoroaster, Ram, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and now as Mayor Baba. As one might expect, this claim has shaken the foundations of many religious belief systems. However, it is estimated that there are over a million people worldwide who believe Mayor Baba's claim to be true. He indicated that as the avatar's appearance always coincides with the spiritual regeneration of man, the period immediately preceding his manifestation is always one in which humanity suffers from the pangs of the approaching rebirth. Currently, man seems more than ever enslaved by desires, more than ever driven by greed. Mayor Baba said, I have come not to teach, but to awaken, and promised nothing less than a new era marked by unprecedented spiritual change. He described avataric periods such as this one as the springtide of creation, bringing a new release of power, a new awakening of consciousness a new experience of life for all. Qualities of energy and awareness are made available for all humanity. Life as a whole is lifted to a higher level of consciousness and geared to a new rate of energy. The transition from sensation to reason was one such step. The transition from reason to intuition will be another. Mayor Baba called this the era of the new humanity a time which would be characterized by the experience of oneness and a time when science will work cooperatively with religion. In the circular dated September the 7th, 1953, Mayor Baba declared, to those of you who desire to approach me, accepting me as the highest of the high, know that you must never come with the desire in your heart which craves for wealth and worldly gain, but only with the fervent longing to give your all, body, mind, and possessions, with all their attachments. Do not ask me to bless you with a good job, but desire to serve me more diligently and honestly, without expectation of reward. Although many people glorified Mayor Baba as God, he said it happens that most of humanity condemns the Avatar while he is physically among them. He said, I am the Ancient One, eternally remembered and worshipped in the past, anticipated in the future, and ignored in the present. Through the periodic incarnation of the Avatar, God consciously becomes man for the liberation of mankind. The question arises, if Maya Baba is the Christ come again, why did he not perform any miracles, similar to those depicted in the biblical scriptures? Maya Baba conveyed, if I am the highest of the high, Nothing is impossible to me, and though I do not perform miracles to satisfy individual needs, time and again at certain periods I manifest the infinite power in the form of miracles 
but only for the spiritual upliftment and benefit of humanity and all creatures. He said, I will not give sight to the blind, but I will make them blind to the world in order to see God. Baba himself was so absolutely dead set against uh, miracles and people attributing miracles to him. And yet all of the time that you were around him, you would notice that uh, uh, the coincidences which occurred uh, were so frequent and so extraordinary. I can remember any number of occasions uh, when things would happen in such a totally unexpected fashion that, you know, they would really keep you gasping. Baba's brother Jal, he had told us that uh, he had not accepted Baba in the beginning as God in human form. And he asked Baba to prove it. He took out his hand and uh, told Baba to put a piece of burning coal in his hand. And Baba just took a coal, a piece of burning coal that was there in the fireplace. He picked it up with a pincer and put it on Jal's hand. And the flesh was burning and Jal said that he couldn't feel the pain. And he was really stunned at that. And as soon as Baba picked it up, he collapsed with pain and he was in the hospital for many days. And uh, that was, J Jal said that was his uh, turning point to accept Baba as God. And he even said that whenever Baba would visit him in the hospital, because his hand had burned very badly, and he said that whenever he would visit and be near him by his bedside, he would not feel the pain. And as soon as he would leave the hospital, he would feel the pain. In 1954, Baba went on a three-month tour of southern India. In Madras, he gave darshan to nearly 150,000 people. Later that year, Mayor Baba gave up the alphabet board entirely and began to rely solely on hand gestures when he wished to communicate with words. Quite different from traditional sign language, these hand gestures were understood by the Mandali and could be read by the layman with a bit of practice. I did buy a whole lot of cashews, little bags of cashews. Baba had a, a way of tossing, uh, tossing grapes or cashews or it, just nobody would ever know where, but you better catch him because that's an extra special gift from the master. In other words, that's his facade or his love gift, you know. And so when he was tossing here and he pretended he was going to toss there and he toss over here, you see. And then the people laughed every time he did that and they were sort of expecting that too, you know. And Baba's sense of humor was so great that I can tell you, we both were once sitting in front of Baba and Guru Prasad and uh, till the age of 20, 20, 21, 22, we were very identical. It was very difficult for people to make out who's Rustam and who's Sora. So once we were sitting in front of Baba and Baba was looking at the both of us, you know, and all of a sudden Baba said, which one is Rustam and which one is Sora? So Baba's brother Jal was standing next to Baba. He pointed out to me and said, Baba, this is Rustam. And I said, no, Baba, no, Baba, I'm Sora, I'm Sora. So Baba had a smile on his face. He says, I am God in human form. I know each and everything that happens in the universe, but still I do not know who's Rustam and who's Sora. That was his, his great sense of humor that he had. Mayor Baba was fond of animals, and he enjoyed recreation, such as marbles, checkers, and the Indian game, Seven Tiles. He said that he accomplished spiritual work through the concentrated energies of the players. In the mid-1950s, he held a number of darshan programs, many of which were attended by Westerners. During this period, most of Mayor Baba's important books and discourses were given or published, including God Speaks, in 1956. In this book, Mayor Baba outlined the path of evolution from stone to human form and on to God-realization. Another book, which was written by Baba's own hand in the mid-1920s, has not been read by anyone, 
and its present whereabouts are unknown. Baba had worked on it for hours daily while reclining in a small box-like structure which he called his table seat. Occasionally he referred to this book as his Bible, implying that it contained stories of his own experiences in the superconscious state and revolutionary new information relating to science. He said the book would be published when the time was right. Mayor Baba explained that the Avatar is always surrounded by a circle of disciples who have deep past connections with him. Because the Avatar works for the benefit of all people, the circle is representative of many personality types which are useful instruments in his universal work. Consciousness being fundamentally one, the Avatar's work with a few affects us all. The Christ Avatar, which Baba is, is in charge of creation. So he has a tremendous responsibility, and he has always emphasized each time the subject came up that uh, the Christ Avatar has the capacity, all of the power that is necessary to do everything in creation. But obviously, one of the things that is terribly important in creation, perhaps almost the most important of all, is the leading of the individual drop soul, the individual human being, back to unity and consciousness of his own godhood. The work that individuals, that the Mondale, even stupid people such as myself, uh, to participate is to assist us in this process of coming back to our own knowledge of our own godhood. It's not because he needs it. That's quite obvious, but it's to help us along that he integrates us. Eric Jesawala, one of Baba's close mandali, functioned as primary interpreter of Baba's signs and gestures. Maya Baba's closest female disciple was Mehra Jahangir Irani, who died in 1989 at the age of 81. Although sex or marriage did not enter into their personal life, Mehra occupied a very special place in Maya Baba's heart. He said, Mehra is my very breath, without which I cannot live. While in India, Baba usually resided at Mehrazad, a countryside ashram not far from Mehrabad in the city of Ahmednagar. Seclusions, which had always been a feature of his work, now became more frequent. He returned to the US again in 1956 and 58, and to Australia as well, where with the help of poet Francis Bravazon and a handful of Australian followers, he established Avatar's Abode, a small center 70 miles north of Brisbane. During Baba's stay in Los Angeles, Los Angeles area, we also drove up to Mayor Mount, and which is a, a spiritual center in o Upper Ojai, uh, normally known as Sulphur Mountain. And uh, Baba and the Mount Leah and a whole busload of people, we all went up there. So Baba was walking up this hill, and I tell you, you could not keep up with him. It's impossible. He just floats over the air. I was out of breath, and many people fell behind, including me. And we just couldn't follow the way he was going. He was going just going along. And his men even uh, were, were running, you know. I mean, and it's just a walk with him. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Between 1962 and 1968, Mayor Baba withdrew even more from public functions, and his physical suffering increased. Although he now received fewer visitors, he held a few mass darshans. Among them, the huge East-West gathering in Pune, India, November 1962. Uh, we were at the East-West gathering. We were about, uh, how old were we? 16 or something. About 16 years old we were then. There were thousands of people from the East and hundreds of people from the West who had come. The preparation for the gathering, Baba had taken great interest because it, it was like bringing the East and the West together. As, as in his love, in his, his love, love as one humanity. The love that poured out from him was really, really, it was felt uh, in the hearts. It was so beautiful. And uh, it was just wonderful. It went on for a couple of days. Until today, people who have been in the East West gathering, they feel, still feel the impact of Baba's love. 
very strongly in the arts. The painter Lin Art met Maya Baba in 1965. I was frightened to death before I went in to see him, but immediately he puts you at ease. It didn't bother me at all that he didn't speak. In fact, if he had spoken, I think I would have gotten an overload. If he had spoken with his voice, it would have been too much to manage. Baba's silence it was actually a symbolic and a metaphorical thing that eventually Baba wants everyone to hear the voice of God speaking to them in their hearts. As the 1960s progressed, more and more young people came to know of Maya Baba. Many had discovered drugs and were now seeking a spiritual direction for their lives. Maya Baba strongly discouraged non-medical drug use, singling out psychedelics such as LSD and marijuana as harmful, physically, mentally and spiritually. Around this time, he began to encourage the direct spreading of news regarding his existence and his message of love and truth. Baba hinted that it was important for more people to become aware of him, but he discouraged followers from fanaticism or attempts to convert others. He did not interfere with any religion and permitted all to follow unhindered their own creeds, but said that, compared with love for God, external ceremonies have no value. In 1966 and 67, Baba's relative seclusion intensified. He began to request the curtailment of casual mail written to him by his followers and permitted even fewer visitors. However, Maya Baba's seclusion was not isolation. He worked with great energy and urgency to finish what he repeatedly termed his universal work. Although the nature of this work was never explained, his followers all over the world were often asked to participate in the work by carrying out specific instructions, frequently involving maintaining silence or remembrance of God's name. The strain of Baba's last seclusion in 1968 took a tremendous toll on his health. Nevertheless, he stated, my work is completed 100% to my satisfaction. The results of this work will also be 100% and will manifest from the end of September. As the autumn of 1968 progressed, Baba's health began to deteriorate. His physical symptoms were baffling to the physicians called in from Bombay and Pune. Blood tests determined that any ordinary person in his condition would be experiencing mental delirium or a coma. But Maya Baba remained alert, joking heartily with the astounded doctors. His condition worsened in January of 1969 as Maya Baba began suffering intense pain. He refused to be taken to Pune for diagnostic tests, indicating that his ailments were purely due to the strain of his spiritual work. I was keeping watch near Baba. Always for years I would keep watch. On 30th of January at night, Mayor Baba says to me, remember this. I am not this body. After one hour, again he says to me, remember this, I am not this body. Of course, it had a great impact on me. Baba would say that when I was Jesus, my crucifixion was only for a day. But this time I am crucified every day. He was in a very critical situation at that time. His body would just spasm would come and his body would lift one foot above the bed up and down, up and down. Little movement means his body would become um, so, um, it would lift and it would become so stiff and hard. So during daytime, of course, six, seven persons would be there to hold Baba. And he was telling us that when he gets the spasm, and his body would lift. He would say that my every part of the bone is just breaking into pieces. And he says, I am 
passing through a greatest crucifixion every moment. At 12.15 p.m. on January the 31st, a great spasm shook Maya Baba's body. His pulse rate fell to nothing and breathing ceased. He was 74 years old. According to previously given instructions, the body was taken to Baba's tomb at Mehrabad and placed in an uncovered crypt where it lay for seven days, unusually resistant to decomposition. A simple burial followed around noon on February the 7th. Maya Baba left no successor and, as he wished, no formal organized religion has developed in his name or from his teachings. However, many followers, or Baba lovers as they are called, often gather informally at homes or meeting rooms to discuss his life and message. Thousands have traveled to Mayorabad to visit his tomb shrine and to Maya Spiritual Center in South Carolina as well. Maya Baba's message is essentially no different from that of Jesus, Abraham, Krishna, Buddha, or Muhammad. He said, be pure and simple and love all because all are one. Live a sincere life, be natural, and be honest with yourself. He said, love is dynamic in action and contagious in effect. Pure love is matchless in majesty. It has no parallel in power and there is no darkness it cannot dispel. It is the undying flame that has set life aglow. The lasting emancipation of man depends upon his love for God and upon God's love for one and all. He added, the practical way for the average man to express love is to speak lovingly, think lovingly, and act lovingly towards all mankind, feeling God to be present in everyone. A lot of Baba lovers felt that when Baba dropped his body, it came as a big uh, bombshell. And till today, we miss his physical presence. Till today, we do miss his physical presence. But at the same time, the feeling of his presence is there. Maya Baba always says that just think about me, remember me, and one day, of course, you will get the grace of love from him. Those who criticize him, oppose him, blame him, he is not going to, uh, going to ignore them. He is the one who embraces the saints, and he is the one who embraces the sinners. If the sinners do not have any room in him, then, of course, he is not the beloved. He is the one who embraces everyone because he is everyone. Maya Baba had said that within 100 years, the whole world will come to know of him, millions traveling to pay homage to his tomb shrine in India. In his universal message issued July the 10th, 1958, Maya Baba said, when I break my silence, the impact of my love will be universal and all life in creation will know, feel and receive of it. It will help every individual to break himself free from his bondage in his own way. Will we experience this breaking of silence? And will a new humanity based on love and intuition emerge from the rubble of our predominantly materialistic society? Perhaps only then will we know if Maya Baba truly was the Ancient One, God in human form.